in three weeks from now, we'll um, hit me with that singular key, Sam. We'll celebrate our 10-year anniversary at this church. And, uh, I know the majority of you, are. Uh, this is our post-pandemic church, so you haven't been with us for that journey. Come up, brother. Yeah, right there. Just minister to God's people. Yeah. Our church started in Stockbridge in a hotel room no bigger than this stage with 12 people in there. And for 10 years, we have seen God's faithfulness, signs and wonders and miracles. We've seen hundreds, maybe even thousands of people brought into the faith through the preaching of the gospel, both locally and abroad, have recorded hundreds and maybe even thousands of testimonies of transformed lives. And, and through every attack and every season and every difficulty, every trial, even through a pandemic, man, God has remained faithful. And, uh, Turn me down to my headphones, Victoria. And, uh, and not just to our church corporately, but I just want to remind you that God is, he's, he's faithful. Yes. And uh, I'm be making a huge announcement on our 10 year anniversary. Because um, we're, we're calling our anniversary not only 10, but end of an era. Yeah. The end of an era. Yeah. Our chapter's about to close. And I'm gonna be making a, a major announcement on our anniversary. Um, no, I'm not stepping down as the pastor of the church. I see some of you scratching your head like I'm going somewhere. <clears throat> but an era is about to close and a new chapter is going to begin. And, and I'll be making a huge announcement on our anniversary. Uh, if you're part of our family and you're watching online from another city, you used to be a part of our family, you moved, man, go ahead and book your flight and get in the room. Um, we want to see you and, and love on you and, um, and show you some love on our 10-year anniversary. Um, welcome, church family, and all of our online family, our guests. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we're just glad you're here. Thankful that you're coming in and you're eavesdropping on these gospel talks we're having as a church. We're in week five uh, of a seven-week series called Seven, and we're studying through Revelation chapter 2 and 3 which is the last document we have recorded in the New Testament of the scriptures. The book of Revelation is a book of uh, apocalyptic prophecies. Whether people believe them or not, everything in that book is going to come to pass um, as it is written. In fact, the writer of the book or the sender of the book said that there is a blessing on everyone who just reads the whole thing. If you just sit there and just read it or listen to it in the audio Bible, it says if you get from chapter 1 to chapter 22, there is a blessing that comes upon you for reading that. I believe a blessing of knowledge and a blessing of wisdom. Because I think when you have knowledge of what's coming in the end, you know how to govern your life for the season that you're in. They missed that. I should say that again. When you have knowledge of what's coming in the end, you know how to govern your life for the season that you're in. Right? And so there's a blessing that the sender says comes upon those who read the whole thing from beginning to the end. We are studying the seven letters that were sent by Jesus through the apostle John while he was on the island of Patmos in a prison island, a prison penal colony for the preaching of God's word. We're studying seven letters that Jesus sent to seven churches who also got seven copies of the entire book of Revelation. Um, these were seven ancient churches in ancient Minor, Asia Minor, which is today modern day Turkey. And um, in this particular message, we're going to look at the solemn words of Christ to the ancient church at Sardis and his words to you and I, the believer. Eternal God and ever wise Father. Lord, in my finite ability, I cannot properly move your people to understand the depths of this message. Holy Spirit, we sense your presence in the room. 
I ask that as I speak, you would give revelation and insight to the sons and daughters of the Father. Maybe even stir the heart of the unbeliever. Minister to the one that's watching me right now across this camera, wherever they are in our city, in our nation, even our family that watches in Australia, people on the continent of Africa, as far away as Ireland. Minister to our brothers and sisters from all around the globe. In the name of your Christ, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> In one of his two ancient memoirs or journals that we have preserved for us in the scriptures. A man named King Solomon, who history tells us was the wisest man that ever lived, he wrote these powerful words in his journal called Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1. Solomon, this wise king, wrote, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Solomon said, It is better for you to have a good name than to have money. He said, it is better for you to have a good name than to have wealth. He said, having a good name, an intangible thing, is far more valuable than having a tangible thing. What is a good name? A good name is synonymous with your reputation. And a reputation is that intangible ID card that you build over a period of time. Your reputation, my reputation, it is built through our actions and it is established by the evaluation of other people as they look at our lives or whatever it is that we are running. A good reputation has great worth and has great value. I'm gonna get ghetto for just a second. I'm from Queens, right? So in the street, a good reputation goes a long way in the street. You can't really gain clout if you don't have a good reputation in the street. A bad reputation in the street can get you killed. A good reputation in the street can put you at certain tables. So a good reputation is valuable in the street. A good reputation is valuable in business. A good reputation is valuable in the marketplace. A good reputation is valuable in the kingdom. How about that? Like she a Christian, but she nasty. She a Christian, but her attitude stinks. Like, a good reputation is valuable even in the kingdom. A good reputation is valuable in any marketplace, no matter what the specific market is, like Apple over Android. Like, if you, if, if you, if you really have the Spirit of God, you have an iPhone instead of an Android. Like if you sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, turn me down. You have an iPhone over an Android. Like we rebuke all of you that turn our group chat green. Every one of you that make the group chat green, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We are trying to keep it blue in here. Elder shouted out, green is life. But blue is from the sky, it comes from above. Blue comes from above. Somebody said, teach, Elder. <laughs> No, I'm just being serious. No. <laughs> when you have a good reputation, a good reputation has the power to garner you trust, has the power to bring you clout, has the power to build what I call relational equity with other people. 
we generally trust people who have a good reputation. There are few things more powerful and advantageous than having a good reputation and the strength of a good reputation. But there is one thing that is very damaging to a good name or a good reputation, and that is when a popular reputation is not undergirded by authenticity. I think I'll say that one more time. There is one thing that is very damaging to having a good reputation, and that is when a good reputation is not undergirded by authenticity. Right? It's like, it's like ordering something from Amazon on the strength of a few good reviews, and then you get the package and find out you was duped on that product that you bought. Right? Or it's like, it's like booking an Airbnb, Lena and Philip, for a vacation in Puerto Rico and then get there and find out that what you booked was really a disaster. And now you're trapped in something that you don't want to be in for the next six days. No, that's never happened to nobody. It's like, it's like pursuing someone you found on Elite or eHarmony or Silver based on a, a, a good profile and some dope DMs and some good conversations that's real steamy only to lean into a relationship with that person you met on Silver to find out this brother is a fool. No work ethic, don't want to get a job, not serious about communication or dating, right? There's something very problematic when someone claims to have a good reputation that's not undergirded by authenticity. It's like, it's like Jesus walking up on a fig tree in Israel and expecting to see fruit because it's fully bloomed from a distance and then getting close on inspection on that fig tree and realize you don't have any fruit on you. So I had to curse the thing that looked good from a distance. Which was a, a, an analogy for people, right? Like from, from a distance, it was, it's, like a, it's like a mirage in the desert, right? Like being in a dry place and searching for something that has water and you keep walking towards that thing thinking you're going to get a drink of water only for the goalpost to keep moving, right? It's like pursuing something that keeps leaving you empty. It's like we, we see that mirage in the desert. It looks good from the distance, but there's no real water there. There's no real life there. There's no trees there. There's nothing green there. The closer I get to it, the more barren it looks. So the only thing damaging to a good reputation is when it's not undergirded by authenticity, when it looks real, but it reeks of phoniness. Yo, enter the church at Sardis. Right? Revelation chapter three and verse one, part A. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, this is the words of Christ, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. To the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Sardis was a city in Asia Minor, which is today Turkey. Nothing remains of that city except a few columns of the ruin of a great temple built to a false god. Sardis was built in a mountain like a fortress stronghold it was a very well fortified city and nobody can ever invade Sardis because it was elevated some 1500 miles above sea level, perfect walled in city built on top of a mountain with a few buildings at the base of a mountain. In history, Sardis was the great capital city of the Lydian Empire and then it became a great capital city for the Greeks and then for the Persians and then for the Romans. Sardis had this reputation for being impregnable. Nobody can't get in there. History tells us on one occasion, a soldier dropped something and went outside the city to get to the bottom of the mountain and some enemy forces saw when he went down and discovered that there was a back door into the city. History tells us that city was invaded twice on sneak invasion when they least expected it because the soldiers who was responsible for guarding the city thought it was so safe, they would just sleep on their watch. Watch. So because they were, watch this word, comfortable, that part, they just kept their feet up. No movement, no watchfulness, no keeping an eye out for any kind of adversary forces. So because we up here and we comfortable and we chilling and we good, 
they sleeping on their job. The city was invaded twice at night, was conquered twice, was destroyed twice, and finally rebuilt during the time of the Roman Empire, but it was like scraps when it was rebuilt. And the people that lived in Sardis would keep talking about their former glory days. You ever met people like this? All you talk about is the past, right? All you keep talking about is five seasons ago, 10 years ago. Well, you're, not, you're not there no more. You're not with that person no more. You're not at that job no more. You're not in that place no more. And the people of Sardis was just known for keep telling stories about their former glory. The church was no different, right? Notice the introduction of Christ to this particular church. He says, the words of him who has the seven stars. We saw in chapter one that the seven stars represent the seven churches that he sent the letters to, reminding them that I am the one that has authority over every church. I am the head of every church. I am the chief person of every church, reminding them about Sardis, who he was to them. I see what y'all are doing, but I am the authority over every church. And then he says, the one who has the seven spirits of God. Every intro he used was specific for that particular city and church. He says, I am the one that has the seven spirits. Now theologians fight over what the seven spirits mean. We know we don't have seven spirits. We have one Holy Spirit. We believe through our study that this is a tagline for the power of the Holy Spirit and all of his various forms, all of his various ministries, all of the things that he does. So Jesus says to the church in Sardis, I want to remind you that I am the one in authority and I come packing the full expression of the Holy Spirit. Now watch part B of verse one. Then he says to them, Jesus said, he had nothing good to say to this church. Revelation chapter three, verse one, part B. I know your works. You can read, right? I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. So he writes this letter to this church. It's the one church he had nothing good to say. He said, I know your works. I see you. I see your posting. I see your emails. I see all your programs. I see everything that y'all are doing. I see your children's ministry. I see your women's ministry. I see your men's ministry. I see your couple's ministry. I see your cooking ministry. I see your bake sale ministry. I see all of your 250 ministries. You know what? In the city, y'all got a reputation for being alive. That's what the people think about you from what they see on the outside. But when I take a close inspection of you, man, you are dead on the inside, Jesus said about them. He said the church of Sardis had a great reputation. They were popular in the city for being alive. They were thought to be men. This is the church. This is the hot spot. This is where everybody wants to be. But he said, you guys were really dead on the outside. Now pause, right? He said, you got a reputation for being alive, right? You got a reputation for being alive. You know what that means? It would not have been obvious to someone walking into their gathering that they were dead. Right? Because if they have a reputation for being alive, it would not be obvious to someone walking into their gathering that they was dead. If a church has a reputation in the city for being alive, all you know is I want to be there, not knowing you see the church different than the way Jesus sees the church. Right? This is not like walking into a church and it's obviously dead. Some of us have walked into gatherings and like, it's obviously dead. This is different. This is like walking into something and in your estimation, you think that this church is alive. This church is popping. This church got it going on. It appears to have everything on its side. It has a big reputation, but this church is void of the spirit. It's popular with people, but not popular with Christ. Right? It has a popular name with people, but not a popular name in heaven. This is akin to a church that's well put together, well organized, well structured, well ran, perfectly manicured, perfect buildings, perfect stained glass, perfect fill in the blank, perfect budget, perfect people, perfect chairs, AC is always perfect, everything is perfect, but the Spirit of God is not there, right? 
a well put together organization, but the spirit of God is not there. This is akin to churches and people that are more dependent on self-reliance than spirit reliance, right? More dependent on the strength of their own programs, their own organization, their own planning, but not really leaning on the spirit. This is, this is akin to those of us who are more dependent on our gifts, our talents and our abilities but we don't lean on the Holy Spirit for guidance and for directions he's like the forgotten God he's a spook we keep locked up in the basement next to the children's ministry right we don't want nothing to do with him God forbid he invades the service or the gathering right this is akin to those of us who are in churches or have done life in such a way we are dependent on our own strength but not the strength of the Holy Spirit this is like How can I put this? Programming over presence. Right? It's we want programming but not presence. We we want this thing so perfect and so manicured, God forbid the Holy Spirit wants to take us in a different direction. We won't yield to him because we don't want him. Right? This is like programming over presence. This is like structure over spirit. This is, this is appearance, but it is dead, right? A great place is we want both. We want to plan and pray. We want programs and presence. We want structure and the spirit. The church at Sardis, heavy programming, heavy structure, heavy posting, heavy email, heavy blah, 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 blah. Y'all Negroes, y'all people, y'all whole body, dead dead right dead like this is personal to me because I refuse to lead a dead church right and people people want to crucify me for yielding to the Holy Spirit I refuse I ain't never see a program heal a sick body Right? I ain't never seen I ain't never seen a perfect program heal a sick body. I ain't never seen a perfect structure heal a sick body. I ain't never seen all of our planning and every single meeting heal a sick body. But you know what I do know? I know there's women in our church who the doctor said will never have children. And the Holy Spirit said, pause what you're doing and have an altar call in the middle of the gathering. I see women put their head on the altar and my wife lay hands on stomach. And there are women right now rocking babies who the doctor said will never have babies. Not because of programming, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit. How many times have you been in a perfectly programmed manicured church and leave dead, leave heavy? Because God forbid the Holy Spirit begin to rise up, we shut him down, and you came in, heard a perfect sermon, three perfect songs, a perfect poem, a perfect structure, and you go home with your same tears. Programming ain't never give birth to signs and wonders. Programming ain't never peel off supernatural signs and miracles. It don't matter how hard a church works to be structured, organized, perfectly manicured, and programmed. There is something you cannot do apart from the Holy Spirit. There's some touches that we need as human beings that a program is not going to give you. There's some ministry we need sometimes in our heart that a perfect structure is not going to give you. There's some you can testify, man, that, man, we deviated a little bit from the program, but I walked out of there with what I needed. Right? Because you can do church without the Holy Spirit there and think that you got something good going on. I just want to remind some of you that the church in the book of Acts was not born off a program. It was born from a group of people that spent 10 days in a prayer gathering. Right? 10 days in a prayer gathering, praying in the room of John Mark's mother's house. Those those 120 believers praying in that upper room was filled with the Holy Spirit by God Almighty. 
burst out into the street of Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in multiple languages. 3,000 people added to the church. Man, the church was born by the power of the spirit, not by the power of planning. And what we see here in Sardis is the same thing we see in churches all across America. Churches that's perfectly programmed, perfectly structured, perfectly manicured, doing ministry, got a popular reputation, but are dead on the inside. We file in and we file out and nobody's ever changed. I want to be in a church that's alive. I want to be in a church where it feels like there's water flowing in that church. I, I want to be in a church where we can sense and feel the Holy Spirit. I want to be in a church when the worship is going forward, we can feel the power of God in the worship. I want to be in a church when the preaching is going forward, I can feel conviction in my soul. I can feel God topping me in my heart. I want to be in a church when I walk out of there, man, I done sweated out my perm, a lash fell off. Like, God touched me when I was in there. I want to go to church and be touched by the finger of God. Am I the only one? I, I want to go into gatherings and, 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 and be in worship with brothers and sisters. I want to hear the, the word preached to me in such a way that I was touched by the finger of God. I want to shed a tear every now and then. I want to feel convicted every now and then. I want to be confronted every now and then. I want to be inspired by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit every now and then. I want to come in with a doctor's report and leave healed every now and then. I want to be alive as a believer. It's frustrating being a dead Christian. It hurts. It's frustrating being dead. Watch the love of God and the charge he gives, Christ gives to the church at Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. He says to them, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I've not found your works complete in the sight of my God. He says to this church, wake up, man. Look, look what he says to this church, wake up. I, I want everybody to look, like, look, look right at me. He says to these, this church, every time you hear the word church, stop thinking, building, or struggle. He's talking to people like you and me. He's telling them to wake up, man. Like, this has been the cry of my heart since I came back from Jerusalem in 2018. To the church, like, we need to wake up. Like, I feel like for so many of us in this room watching me on camera, churches all across this nation, can we just pause for just a second? Like, what really are we doing? What, what, what really are we trying to accomplish? I feel like all across this nation, maybe even seasons in our own church, like, I feel like Christ is screaming to the church in America, like, we need to wake up in this hour. Like, are we, are we paying attention to what's happening around us? Are we paying attention to what's happening on the news? Are we discerning what time we're living in? Like, is it just service in and service out? Right? Is it just Sunday in and Sunday out? Like, I feel the Spirit of God, like, beckoning to His people. Like, man, we need to wake up and recognize what, what time we're living in. Yeah. What hour are we living in? Like, the, like the, the return of Christ is, is, is closer today than it's ever been before. Like, we, we, can, we can feel his hand on the doorknob of eternity. Like, like, why are we content to just Sunday in and Sunday out and church in and church out and program in and per program out when we don't know that the Lord is soon to return? And, and, and I feel like what the enemy has done and what culture has helped to do and what our flesh is doing is like lulling us into a sleep. We, 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 we're just drowning in apathy. We, we, we're drowning in lethargy. We're drowning in indifference. We drive past the homeless and we don't care. We have unsaved family members and friends and we don't care. There are people with your last name who are headed to hell and you don't care. We don't care if the church or the strength of the church depended on your prayer life, how strong would the church be? Wow. Wow. That's good. Man, we got believers all around this country, believers sitting in this church. Well, I used to be like this when I first got saved, man, thinking that this whole thing was just about a service. 
And I reduced Christianity to just a service and checking off my box. And if I went to church on Sunday, God was pleased with me and I checked off my box. Never mind, I cared less about the loss. I cared less about the mission of Christ. And I feel like God is screaming from this book. He's screaming to us He's like, wake up my sons and daughters. Wake up my sons and daughters. He's trying to deliver us from being, from being uh, asleep. Man, you, you got to even like beg Christians to, to praise or, or you, they, we, 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 we drag ourselves like we're doing God a favor. Right? We, we, we drag ourselves in here like we're doing God a favor. You know, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. We, 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 we come in like, like God owes us something. And I feel like God is screaming to not just victory, to, to, this, to the church in the United States at least. I'm going to just speak for my own nation. Like God is wake up. Like, you know, for some of us, it may, it may take persecution to wake us up. I don't know. Maybe it may take losing some of our comforts to wake us up. It, it might take God making us uncomfortable in this nation to wake us up. Like some of you, like we, we, we come into these gatherings and you know what? We just want to be entertained. We, we, we use the worship team like cheerleaders and then we sit in the, in the, in the chairs and we fold our arms hoping for some preacher to, 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 to move you emotionally. I wonder right now as I'm talking how many services are happening around the country. It's like funerals are happening around the country. He says, y'all need to strengthen what remains. It's a word of hope that you could be made alive again. Right? It shows the displeasure of Christ with a dead Christianity. Right? Dead churches all across this nation where the spirit of God is not felt. And I think probably the worst thing about it, look right at me, is that we just accept that as normal. I want to just talk to you from my heart, like pause. We just accept dead Christianity, dead faith, dead churches, dead conferences, dead gatherings, dead sermons, dead worship sets. Like it's just normal. Like we accept that as that's the way it's supposed to be. That's not the church I see in the book of Acts. Like just think about what we have now as church. I want you to really think about this. We, 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 we get dressed, we drive, we come, we sit down, we get entertained, we go home, we do that over four days, four times a month. And we think this is Christianity, right? We, we, we really think this is Christianity. And, and we, we see here in the text, man, the displeasure of Christ with a church that had a reputation for being alive but was dead. I, I, remember, I remember being in Israel in December 2018 and being at the garden tomb and, and, and hearing a group of believers singing songs in a language I did not understand. And because I was nosy and I could feel the spirit, although I did not understand the language, I could feel the spirit of God coming on for them. And I, and I crept into their gathering. I was only the only black person in the gathering, so I couldn't hide. And they're singing song in some language, and I don't know what the language is, but I could feel the spirit of God in that, in, in that garden tomb area. And, and I remember the, the leader of, of that little group, man, he, he called me to the front, and he began to speak to me in some language I did not understand. And it just so happens there was a translator in my group, and he began to translate what this person was saying. He was speaking in Portuguese, and he said to me in Portuguese, the translator gave it to me in English, he says, I've been to your nation. I've been in your country. And I've seen your churches, how they are dead and dying. All across your nation, your nation is dotted with dead churches. And he said to me, young man, do you want to go back to your nation and do anything about that? And I fell down on my knees. I said, yes, sir. I want to do anything about that. He says, receive a double anointing and praise over my life. Right? And I've never been the same since. Like, I, I, I can't just do services and go home and, and be content with, with everything perfectly manicured. And we have no movement of the Holy Spirit. 
Like I pray all the time, God, please don't call me home before you allow me to be a part of some real revival, not some word we throw on a flyer for a Monday night service. I said, Lord, I don't want to die. Please don't call me home. I don't want to arrive in your presence with my life never being a part of something that was much bigger than just a Sunday morning service. I I want to see the outpouring of God's presence in our nation. I want to see the lost turn to God in sweeping numbers. I want to see sons and daughters come back to Christ in great numbers. I want to see the church of Jesus come alive in this nation. I want us to, to, I want us to care about the things that Jesus cares about. I want, I want our prayers to not just be filled with the laundry list of everything we want. I want you to, I want you to shed a tear, not for you. See, I feel like even as I'm talking to you, I feel resistance in the room because we're so American. Like, I I want you to get to the point where you actually kneel down and can shed a tear and it's not for you. Where you can spend some time crying out for somebody and it's not for you. I want you to actually care about the things that Christ cares about. I want you to be frustrated with cultural Christianity. I want you to not accept that as normal. I want you to walk into a dead gathering and start praying, God, saturate this place in your presence. I want you to not feel it strange to kneel down in a gathering or to walk the aisles and pray or to lay hands on the person next to you or to come fall down at the altar in the middle of my sermon. I want you not be bound by the things we call cultural and normal. Normal is why the church in America is dry. We so normal, we dry. We so perfectly programmed, we dry. But I actually want you to care about the things that Christ cares about. What must they do to wake up? I'm almost done. Verse 3. He says, remember then what you have received and heard. He said, keep it and repent, he said to them. He says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief in the night. That's a tagline for, you remember how your city was invaded in the dark? He said, you better wake up or I'm going to come to you, he said to this church, like a thief almost in the night. And you will not know at what hour I came against you. So Jesus, man, in his love, he gives them a pathway to coming alive. He gives them a pathway to revival. He says to them first, remember what you heard. I'm talking to you now in the room. He says, man, remember what you heard what did you hear remember the gospel he was saying to them that you heard that you was once a sinner separated from God you was once alienated from the commonwealth of Israel but because of the power and the generosity of Christ via the Holy Spirit you was made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit God unzipped you took out your unrighteousness put in his righteousness put in his spirit zipped you back up and made you a son and daughter remember how I rescued you from darkness remember how I brought you into the light remember how I signed your name in the role of heaven remember how I spared you from damnation remember where you was when I found you religious or far away from me man remember what you heard and then he says to them remember what you received man when God saved you he didn't just give you a sermon he gave you a piece of himself Man, when God saved me in a bathroom over a toilet seat, he didn't give me a sermon. He gave me a piece of himself. He took a piece of himself and filled me with that over a toilet seat. He reminded me that there's something inside of me that came from heaven. I'm not an ordinary man. I am a regenerated man. You're not an ordinary woman. You are a regenerated woman. You're not an ordinary man. You are a regenerated man. You're not just a husband, just a wife, just an employee, just a volunteer. Are you crazy? You are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You are a walking, breathing miracle. You are a walking, breathing house of the power of God. There is anointing at your fingertips. We can lay hands on the sick and the sick can, can recover. Who am I talking to? Do you know how powerful you are? Your prayers can shift atmospheres and rooms. Take down principalities and power and disrupt nations. From your prayer closet, you can disrupt nations from your prayer closet. You got power at your fingertips. You keep praying for them, lay hands on them and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Lay hands on the person next to you. I believe by faith, a report is gonna come back to us from this day. Somebody shout, in the power and the name of Jesus. Be healed. Nah, you said that like you don't think the Holy Spirit is in you. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Be healed. No, 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 no. Let's go mind and heart. Lay hands on them again. Say, in the name of Jesus. Man, be healed. Somebody pray. Just disrupt the room for just a second. Come on. Disrupt the atmosphere for just a second. Come on. We pray for healing in your mind, healing in your heart, healing in your body. Disrupt the room for just a second. Disrupt the room. Disrupt. Now, you want to see faith? If you sick in your body, run down here right now. Come on. I don't care if it's a cold. It could be HIV or STD in the middle of the sermon. Get up here. Somebody disrupt the atmosphere right now. Come on, disrupt the atmosphere right now. I don't care if you got a cold or STD, run down here right now. Somebody disrupt the atmosphere right now. We're not dead, we're alive. Come on, disrupt the atmosphere right now. Come on, get close, get close, get close. Disrupt the atmosphere right now. Come on, get close. Get close, get close, get close. Hold one key, come up higher. Bring up the volume. Yeah, I'm doing this in the middle of my sermon. I'm not even finished yet. Come on, get close. See, a program can't give this to you. You need to be touched by the Holy Spirit. Come up higher. If you out there, dis disrupt the atmosphere with praise and pray. We're going to get a testimony from this moment. I promise you. Holy Spirit, I won't touch one person. I pray you would move across this road, across this stage, whatever's going on in these bodies. Not for our glory, but for yours, Lord Jesus. I pray you would touch. I pray you would heal. I pray you would drive away all men of sickness and disease, malady. Touch somebody's mind right now and give them peace. Touch somebody's heart and give them hope. Touch somebody's body and give them a new report according to Isaiah 53. I pray a sweeping healing. A 
sweeping healing, a sweeping touch. Touch. Catch the tears that are falling at this altar. Sweep, Holy Spirit. Catch the tears that are falling at this altar. Yeah, right there. He's yeah, that's right. Let that out. It's okay. Let it out. Let it out. That's the Holy Spirit. I didn't even touch you. Let it out. It's okay. Good. Let it all out. Something's breaking right now. Break. Break. Fall off in the name of Jesus. Open barren rooms. Let mothers walk away from this platform. Let people walk away with peace and hope and healing, encouragement. Catch every tear falling at this altar right now, Lord. For no one touched them but you, Holy Spirit. Look at all these tears. That ain't programming. That's called presence. He sees you, Jasmine. He sees you, Inez. He sees you. You believe that? You believe that? I said, do you believe that? Do you believe that? You believe that he sees you. Do you believe that? Everybody at the altar, I'm going to ask you to either, either gracefully walk back to your seat or just sit on the floor right where you are. Like, do something different. You could just sit right there in God's presence or go back to your seat. Whatever you feel comfortable with, it doesn't even matter to me. You, you could go back to your seat or sit right here in the front. I see you brother I see you brother I see y'all sitting up here I see you my sister whoever the sister is y'all give her a seat right here on this front row Sam just stay with me softly I gotta just let me just close let me finish this just be seated let me just read to you the rest Okay. The Lord.
Lord said in verse 3, part B, if you do not wake up, I will come to you like a thief in the night. You will not know what hour I come against you. He said, I will come to you. How does the Lord respond to the dead? I'm letting you know. He, he responds to the dead only one or two ways. He either visits the dead with discipline or he visits the dead with revival. And it's just really based on your heart. He will either visit the dead with discipline or he'll just visit the dead with revival. Now you could be in a dead place and longing for a touch from God and he could visit your life with revival. Or you could be in a dead place just running from God and he just visits you with discipline to make you turn around. Let's just finish the verse, verse 4. And yet you have a few names in Sardis people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. I love how Christ always sees those who are the remnant in every gathering. Those who have not turned away from him, he gives them an eternal promise. And I just want to give you these four signs of a dead or dying church. So if you ever walk into one, you know to run from that place or pray for that place. And then I'll pray for us with these last two verses. You know a church is dead or dying, number one, when facade replaces fire. Where it's all about appearance but not about the Holy Spirit. Number two, you know a church is dead or dying when the preference of the people replaces the passion of Christ. It's all about what we want, but not about what Christ wants. It's about the mission statement you have on your wall, but not the mission statement he gave us in the Gospels. It's like, what are we doing? We are trying to spread the gospel and multiply disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do. He didn't tell us to do all these other things that we're busy doing. A lot of churches are going to be busy, and a lot of believers are going to be busy and arrive in heaven and realize you missed it the whole time. So we're more concerned oftentimes about our preference but not his passion. His passion is soul winning and making disciples. You know what church is dead or dying when gospel preaching is replaced by people pleasing. Where sermons are only conditioned to not offend nobody because we worried about you coming back next week. We're not preaching the scriptures. We're not telling you the truth because we want to be liked. And number four, we know what church is dead or dying when gatherings feel rote and not real. It's just mechanical but we don't feel life there and he closes his letter to this church says the one who conquers the one who fights to last to the end will be clothed in white garments and I will never blot out his name from the book of life I will confess his name before my father and before the angels and he who has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches he says the one who endures to the end, the one who follows me for real, the one who stays connected to me. A day is coming when I, Jesus, I'm going to open the book and all the names that rejected me, all the names that were not part of my family, they, they are not there. They are blotted out. And what God is going to do, what Jesus is going to do, everybody look right at me. He's going to take the names that remain. The names that were faithful, the names that were chosen, the names that belonged to the Father from the beginning of time. He's going to take the book full of those names. It says Philip there. And I see Rhonda there. And Tiana. And I see Lena and Malachi, Israel, Abigail, and Josiah. I see Courtney and Kenneth. I see Milton and Eric and He's going, to take, he's going to take the names that remain after everything is said and done and he's going to turn and he's going to present that book to the Father. And he's going to say, Father, these are those whose names were not blotted out. The ones who walked with me for real, the ones who made it to the end, 
the ones who toiled and suffered and labored and gave and prayed, the ones who were misunderstood but did not abandon me, the ones you chose from the very beginning, the ones who are faithful, the ones who came out of the persecution of the world, they have washed their robes in my blood. Here, Father, here are the ones you will reward for all eternity. Here are the ones that will reign and rule with me. All their names are in the book. From every nation, tribe, and tongue, from Queens, New York, to Atlanta, Georgia, they made it. All the ones that were going to victory and getting their toes stepped on every week and came down to their altar and put their faith in God. Here, Father, these are the ones I want to reign and rule with me forever. close this message. I'm not even sure what to do. Um, I'll just the Lord wants you to be alive and not dead. And if, if you're in a dead place in this room, man, there, you have only one real pathway back to being alive. It's, it's, it's stirring up a prayer life that, that starts to set you again on fire. It's having access to God's word. It's being in community with brothers and sisters who are also on live. It's, it's worship. It's, it's all the things that puts us in his presence. I mean, my whole thing is all messed up right now, but you know what? I don't even care. How old are you? 20? How old? 20. Are you alive? You look like you're not sure. Are you sure or you're not sure? You are now. Amen. Father, I pray for every dead person in this room. I pray for every dead church across America that you have ordained but is dying. I pray for all those who are your sons and daughter who are in a dry and barren place. I pray for those of us who are in the desert. Father God, I pray you would breathe on this house. I pray you would breathe on churches across this nation. I pray you would breathe, God, Lord, on your body across this nation. I pray you would cause your children to come alive in the name of Jesus. Awaken us from our slumber and our sleep. Awaken us from apathy and lethargy. Awaken us from our indifference, Lord. Father, stir up on our hearts, oh God. Let us feel your presence when we are alone. Burn us in our prayer time. Throw down coals of fire upon our homes and our gatherings, Lord. Father God, I pray, God, Lord, all across this nation, I pray for real revival, God, in churches you have ordained. I pray for revival in homes and marriages and hearts, God, in the name of Jesus. I pray you make a people come alive. Father, we, we, we want a living faith and not a dead faith. I pray you would, you would, you would breathe on a spirit of the living God. Lord, I, I don't know. I pray in these last days where people are, are, are playing around and churches are playing around and we're busy but not fruitful. I, I, I don't know, God, I, I just, I, I pray, Lord, that you will look down upon your body in this nation, every man, woman, and child that belongs to you and just bring about revival in our soul.
let us come alive in this house and houses all across this nation. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Somebody just help me just worship God for just...